Hello and welcome. It's National Invasive Species Awareness Week, and we are so excited that you are here with us today for day three of our webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is titled The Regulatory Process for Approving Classical Weed Biocontrol Agents. My name is Elizabeth Brown. I am your Legislative Affairs, Professional Development, and Certified Weed-Free Products Program Manager here at the North American Invasive Species Management Association. Before we get started with today's presentation, I would like to just share a few things with you about NASMA for those of you that don't yet know us well. Our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. A little bit about what we do. Here at NASMA, we are the stewards of international standards, including our mapping standards and the certified weed-free product standards for forage, gravel, and new this year, mulch. National Invasive Species Awareness Week, which happens twice a year in February and again in May. What we're doing here this week, so much goodness all over the continent related to NISA. Our focus is education and advocacy. Public education, outreach, awareness is also part of our core mission here at NASMA, and our Play Clean Go program uh, is phenomenal. If you're not familiar with it, please check it out at playcleango.org and get ready for Play Clean Go Awareness Week happening June 6th through 12th. Professional development is one of our main focuses at NASMA. We have the Invasive Species Manager Certification Program. We're just finishing up our spring semester right now and summer semester starts in June. So check that out at our website, nasma.org. Also webinars and trainings just like this one. We host a monthly webinar the third Wednesday of every month. And of course this week with NISA, we have webinars every day. And then our annual conference, which is happening September 27th through 30th in Missoula, Montana. Hopefully you'll be able to join us in person, but if not, don't worry. We will offer a virtual option, so we'll have a hybrid experience this September, so you can check us out online or in person depending on what you're available to do. If you're not yet an ASMA member, I invite you to please explore our options. We have three uh, individual memberships for you to choose from. And we have four partnership opportunities available. We will also customize a partnership if you're interested in that. Lots of benefits for our NASMA members, including my favorite, which is our first Fridays. It's a members only networking session that happens the first Friday of every month. This month it's taking place, or next month, mm -hmm, the next one is on June 4th uh, at 2 p.m. Central and is focused on public, public education and outreach efforts in advance of Play Clean Go Awareness Week. Right, so there you go. A little bit about NASMA. Again, our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. All right, let's get right on with the show. I want to remind you today's webinar, unlike the other webinars this week, today is a 90-minute webinar. We have four outstanding speakers for you today. I'm really personally very excited about the information that they're going to share with you today so that we can all really know and understand the process for biological control and have a lot of confidence in what we're doing out in the field because it's a really important tool in the fight against invasive species management. So with that, we have four speakers our first speaker is Charlene Singh. She is a research entomologist with the United States Department of Agriculture, Forest Service, Rocky Mountain Research Station. Next up after Charlene, we'll have Cindy Hall. She is the National Coordinator for Integrated Pest Management with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Cindy and Courtney Stonehouse will present together. Courtney is a biologist in ecological services, again, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And finally, we'll have Dr. Bob Fannin-Steel, who is the senior entomologist and biological control specialist with the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal Plant Health Inspection Services, APHIS, Pest Pathogen and Biological Control Permitting Unit. All right, so enough from me. Let's get right into our presentation. Charlene, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and pop on camera, you are welcome to take it away. And friends watching, again, thank you so much for being here and attending today. 
Hello, my name is Charlene Singh. I'm a research entomologist with the USDA Forest Services Rocky Mountain Research Station, and I also serve as the chair of the Technical Advisory Group for Biological Control Agents of Weeds, also known as the TAG. As the first of four presenters today, my role will be to define what we mean by classical biological control of weeds and to discuss the initial steps in a new weed biocontrol program. I will also describe the TAG's advisory role in the weed biocontrol regulatory process. The basic definition of biocontrol of any kind is using one living organism to control another. In terms of weed biological control, that can include diverse options, ranging from grazing, planting desirable species to competitively displace a target weed, to the focus of today's webinar, classical biological control. What specifically makes it classical biological control? First and foremost, the target weed is not a native North American species, which means its native range is on a different continent. Because it is now a weed here in North America, at some time in the past, the target weed was either intentionally or accidentally moved from its native range to North America. Thereafter, it successfully established, proliferated and spread and is now invasive in North America. These weeds were able to become invasive primarily because in North America, they are separated from their co-evolved population regulating natural enemies. The main point of classical biological control of weeds is therefore to reunite weeds with their native range natural enemies. In the most basic terms, impact occurs when agent exploitation of plant resources is destructive. Destructive activities that can injure destroy or remove plant tissue include feeding, laying eggs, developing or sheltering in flowers, leaves, seeds, roots, stems, or branches. Under some circumstances, these activities can also impede normal metabolic functioning, impairing, reducing, or eliminating, for example, successful reproduction and photosynthesis. In some cases, agent activities such as feeding or egg laying also facilitate the introduction of harmful plant pathogens. Destructive exploitation of plant resources can ultimately compromise fitness, either at the individual or population level. Note that I refer here generically to plants because as researchers, regulators, and technical advisors, we need to remain open to the possibility that agent impact can occur on both target and non-target plant species. Steps in a new weed biocontrol program should begin with consulting the TAG manual. The TAG manual provides a comprehensive list of information that will be used in all regulatory decision making. Contact is also recommended early and often with the TAG, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and APHIS for guidance on specific topics such as the selection of test plants, identifying potential conflicts of interest, and assessing possible risks associated with biocontrol releases. A new weed biocontrol program typically begins with initiation, specifically identifying a target and scoping to determine the feasibility of a biocontrol program to manage it. Important but different aspects of the initiation process are investigated in North America and in the native range of the target weed, based initially on available literature and other records. In North America, researchers, land and resource managers, and many different types of stakeholders should work together to confirm that for many reasons, a new biocontrol program for the proposed target weed is justified. This should always begin by confirming that the target weed is well established and widespread. Second, negative ecological and economic impacts of the target weed should be documented. Third, biocontrol should be investigated because infestations of the target weed are large and therefore difficult or prohibitively expensive to control with existing management options. These two bullet points identify potential regulatory red flags. It is important to determine if the proposed target weed is known to be closely related to agricultural, horticultural, or culturally sensitive plant species. The second point might be difficult to know a priori, but if possible, consider at this point the possibility that the proposed target weed might directly or indirectly be a critical resource for a native, threatened, or endangered species. Finally, 
realistically assess if conflicting perspectives on the perceived value or harm of the proposed target weed, if they exist, are likely resolvable. During initiation of a new program for biological control, our overseas collaborators are grappling with an entirely different set of questions related to the target weed's identity, location, and accessibility in the native range. First, our extant literature, herbarium records, and species distribution records associated with the target weed and close relatives adequate. Second, are the taxonomy systematics of the target weed resolved and likely to remain stable? These two points address the feasibility of studying the target weed and its specialist herbivores. At this stage, one of the most important regulatory considerations is to confirm that permits can be obtained to collect candidate agents and if everything pans out, to eventually ship them to North America. At this point, it seems important to discuss regulations governing one country's access to biocontrol agents that originate from another country. Under the 1992 United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, the sovereign rights of countries over their genetic resources are protected. The objectives of the CBD are the conservation of biodiversity, sustainable use of its components, and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources. In October 2008, the International Organization for Biological Control, also known as the IOBC, established its Global Commission on Biological Control and Access and Benefit Sharing, or ABS. The Commission's mission was to provide scientific advice to oversee and advise the design and implementation of ABS in a way that would ensure practical and effective arrangements for the collection and use of biological control agents, which are acceptable to all parties involved in this issue. ABS is action by the Nagoya Protocol. Each country signed on to the protocol is required to develop laws and measures to ensure the fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising under the utilization of biocontrol agents sourced from them. Returning now to the list of overseas collaborators' considerations. Access to populations of the target weed across a range of habitat and climate types relevant for where biocontrol agents will be used in North America is also obviously important. A practical consideration is if the target weed and North American relatives can be maintained without too much difficulty for host specificity testing purposes at overseas collaborators' research facilities. This would also obviously involve obtaining permits to import and propagate North American plant species, sometimes outdoors in research plots. Finally, it is important to verify that after spending years, if not centuries, in North America, key characteristics of the target weed here have remained similar to those of conspecifics in the native range. Otherwise, natural enemies collected in the native range may not adequately recognize or impact North American target weeds. The second step in a new weed biocontrol program is focused on pre-release research and development. This includes various aspects of what is broadly referred to as foreign exploration and initial host specificity testing. The first step in foreign exploration involves extensive planning and logistics, developing a network of local contacts, including scientists, fixers, guides, and sometimes security, to conduct our or facilitate field surveys for potential biocontrol agents in the native range. This step also involves distinguishing target weed incidental visitors from true natural enemies. Potential agents are identified from a pool of invertebrates and pathogens collected from the target weed at this stage. The second stage of foreign exploration is to assess the type and severity of herbivory by the target weed's natural enemies in the field. Initial assessments of agent biology and host specificity are also conducted at this time. The test plant list is also generally finalized at this point. Now on to an overview of host specificity testing uses a stepwise objective approach to identify the plant species that a candidate agent can and will use. Host specificity is how we characterize the degree to which a candidate biological control agent is restricted in the number of host plants it utilizes. Host range in weed biocontrol 
is the suite of host plants utilized by a candidate biological control agent, categorized according to the degree of taxonomic relatedness of confirmed hosts. The aim is to find specialist herbivores that are monophagous or stenophagous, utilizing one or few closely related hosts, which is consistent with the very narrow host range. The goal of host specificity testing is to accurately characterize host range so that potential risk of the candidate agent to non-target organisms can be confidently predicted. Non-target organisms in this case would be native and crop or ornamental plants directly impacted by the candidate agent, along with the indirectly impacted organisms that use both the target weed and non-target plants. Types of host specificity testing can differ based on where the testing takes place. Initial host specificity tests are often conducted under controlled conditions in labs, greenhouses, or other confined indoor spaces. This type of oversimplified environment may not adequately reflect behaviorally influential sensory aspects of North American field conditions. Confinement itself can create the potential for overestimating host range. Field-based tests are conducted outdoors under less controlled conditions. This makes it possible to assess host specificity under more natural conditions, but outcomes can be affected by unanticipated factors. Types of host specificity testing can also differ based on experimental design in terms of the number of plant species presented to the candidate agent. Nose choice tests typically evaluate agent feeding, egg laying, or development when confined on one plant species at a time. This type of test is valuable for identifying non-target plant species that might be at risk. Single or paired choice tests compare agent response when presented with two different plant species at the same time. This type of test is useful for confirming under limited choice conditions that the agent will or will not select a non-target test plant species. These results differentiate host use that occurs under confined no choice conditions and host use based on agent preference. Multiple choice tests evaluate agent response when simultaneously presented with multiple plant species. Because this type of test is generally conducted in larger cages with multiple potential hosts, it is a better gauge of agent response under field conditions. This yields a better approximation of realized or ecological host range. Finally, differences in the type of host specificity data produced can yield two different types of host range physiological or realized. Physiological host range identifies all plant species that the candidate agent will accept or use under confined, no choice conditions. The realized or field host range is a subset of the physiological host range. It includes plant species that the candidate agent accepts or uses under non-confined or choice conditions. This brings us to the last important step in a new weed biocontrol program developing and submitting a petition for a permit to make environmental releases of a new biocontrol agent. Guidelines for developing a petition are available through the TAG manual. Although I'm showing a picture of the old TAG manual on the lower left, the most up-to-date version available online should be consulted early and throughout all stages of petition development. To find a link to the TAG website, and a PDF of the TAG manual, simply search APHIS TAG. Now on to an overview of the TAG and its role in the regulatory process for classical biological control of weeds. The current version of the TAG was established in 1987. The TAG functions under USDA APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine, or APHIS PPQ. TAG membership remains voluntary. The role of the TAG is to provide scientifically justified, unbiased recommendations. The TAG functions as a liaison between the biological control community and APHIS, advising petitioners about issues related to test plant lists and host specificity testing and research. This is the list of TAG member agencies. TAG members primarily represent the interests of U.S. federal agencies. Additional and valuable perspective is provided by the National Plant Board and the Weed Science Society of America, along with input from representatives of Canada and Mexico. The mission of the TAG is simply to facilitate biocontrol of weeds in North America 
by providing guidance to researchers and recommendations to regulatory agencies for or against the release of non-indigenous biological control agents of weeds. This is based on considerations of potential non-target impacts, conflicts of interest, natural resources, agricultural production, and the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, Threatened and Endangered Species List. The objectives of the TAG are to incorporate member agencies' concerns and perspectives into planning biological control programs, provide an exchange of views, information, and advice for individuals who plan to ask various federal and state regulatory agencies for permission to release these agents into the environment, and provide recommendations to APHIS PPQ for use in making permitting decisions. The TAG bottom line is that TAG members do not make final decisions on the approval or permitted action for the release of biological control agents of weeds in North America. TAG members only recommend to APHIS PPQ that a proposed biological control agent be approved or denied permission for release and recommend to petitioners specific actions to take before they apply for a formal permit. My sincere thanks to Rich Hansen, Al Francesco, Carol Randall, and Bob Fannin Steele for their contributions to the content of this talk. Moving along, next up, we have Cindy Hall and Courtney Stonehouse with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And Cindy is going to kick us off with this presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Yep, I am Cindy Hall. I am the National Coordinator for Integrated Pest Management at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And part of my duties involves review and uh, contributing to the uh, review process for biological control agents of weeds. And I will talk about our roles in that regulatory process. And Courtney will follow me and discuss our responsibilities um, under the Endangered Species Act. Next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, our mission is to work with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. So we have three roles in the review of biological control agents of weeds. And I wanna stress its review because as Charlene mentioned, we are, our agency is not the permitting agency. We contribute through our role in the technical advisory group for biological control agents, which is a USDA technical advisory group. So we will review the test plant lists we will review petitions once a uh, researcher has submitted their research in the form of a petition to the USDA. And then should the USDA APHIS make a determination that they're going to proceed through the permitting process, there might ensue an Endangered Species Act consultation, and we would have a role in that with USDA. Next. So I am the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service representative. To, to the technical advisory group. And so I am the person who receives the test plant list at our agency. And I tend to not do that review in a vacuum. I seek out other subject matter experts in the Fish and Wildlife Service. So I share that test plant list with our integrated pest management coordinators, those of us in the agency who work on invasive species management, plant taxonomists, entomologists, and I also especially seek out those biologists and our land managers who work in the states or the regions of the country where the target weed is most troublesome. Those, those are our people who might be dealing with the target weed the most, and they might have the most to gain from an effective biocontrol agent and interest in, obviously, in the release of a non-indigenous, non-native agent into North America, into that region. I also try to seek out some input from our land managers who are potentially in the area where the initial releases might be proposed, if we know that. So I provide the test plant lists and a format for our people to provide a review. And I also am very clear with our people that the test plant list, as with the petition, is a researcher's intellectual property, and they are not to share that outside of our agency. As with many federal, you know, many agencies, we all have professional subject matter experts, colleagues, many of whom are not in our own agency, but this is information that our people cannot share. All right, next. So uh, the test plant list will generally have 
seven different categories. This is all described in the, in the biocontrol manual that Char Charlene was showing us in her last slides, and you can read these various categories. The Fish and Wildlife Service, we're going to hone in on anything that might be a threatened and endangered species, either in the same genus or family, some species that might be, have some phylogenetic or morphological or other biochemical similarities to the uh, target. We are going to look at any, anywhere on the in the categories where there might be a federally listed species. We see this time when the test plant list arrives as a really good point in the process where coordination or communication can begin with a researcher. We in particular, because we have responsibility for the Endangered Species Act, we don't like to be the agency that kind of comes in at the very end of a very long process and has concerns. So we see this as a very good time to begin communicating and coordinating with researchers. Next. It's also a good time, actually, when a researcher, if they've got some federally listed plant species on their list that they're going to do for which they hope to test. It's a good time when they can find out from us how to procure federally listed plant seeds or plant material. And that's not necessarily something that I do in my role at headquarters, but I can help facilitate the coordination with the people in the field who can help a researcher in that area. We I receive all different types of comments from our people in the field. Sometimes it's something as it seems simple, but it actually can it can be it can be annoying for the researchers. In that, uh, sometimes a person will begin their research and their work. Let's say they begin working on something in 2004. They work on, you know, and they work maybe for a decade or more. And plant species might be just a uh, sensitive, or might be rare, or maybe it's listed as endangered or threatened in a state, but it's not on the federal list of endangered species. But when they go through their development period and they submit their petition to the USDA, it could be a decade or more. And at that point in time, perhaps a species is now listed on the threatened and endangered species list for the US. And so it's a good it's good for, it's useful to a researcher to always be periodically checking on the status of a species. And similarly, uh, a species could be listed as uh, was the Colorado butterfly plant in 2000, but by 2019, at the time we might have seen the petition, the species was no longer listed. It was, we call it delisted. Similarly, our folks are sometimes concerned with native plants that are co-occur where the uh, target weed is and where the uh, biocontrol agent might be released. And they may be concerned about non-target impacts. When a researcher might decide, you know, a threatened and endangered species plant is on the list, but they decide not to do testing, we always look for the reasons and what underpins their decision to not uh, proceed with testing. And uh, we may um, be able to help them further with that decision or, or just concur with that. It, and sometimes in the recently we've decided within our agency, and I think perhaps other agencies too, to start looking at species that might potentially be at risk in Alaska. Traditionally, we don't look at Alaska. It's pretty far distant from the contiguous states, but given the range expansion of many species with changing conditions, we think that it might behoove us to start um, considering federally or state listed threatened and endangered species in Alaska. Next slide. So in terms of the petition, we will certainly focus on all of the test results, the non-choice test results, and those of choice and field testing. And we look for any type of activity on threatened and endangered listed plant species or surrogates thereof. We also might look at any species that were included in the testing that might be a keystone species in an ecosystem. And we might look to see uh, if there were impacts there. And for us, it would be a keystone species in a particular ecosystem. And we would be especially interested if there, there are threatened and endangered species that are native to that habitat or dependent on that keystone species in that system. So we're looking in the Fish and Wildlife Service, we're looking at all of the biological information related to the potential for exposure of threatened and endangered species, plants, other sensitive plants, or other non-targets. 
And you know, if there's a potential for exposure, what's the risk? What is the potential for exposure? And then what is the risk? Next slide. So this is a straight out of the TAG manual. In addition to looking at impacts to threatened and endangered species, which is certainly a focus of Fish and Wildlife Service, we all are also looking at impacts of the target weed. And to see that a petitioner has covered those in, in the work that they present to us in the petition. Next. So this is the URL for the Environmental Conservation Online System. It's available to the public and it is a database of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, next. And it's very easy to use. You can query on species reports, next. You can put in a common name of a species or a genus and species name, next. Or you can search by family. And in this case, by example, we put in Brassicacea, next. You submit your search. And for this particular family name search, your end results are all, the, all of these listed species. You can see the listing status is in the, over there in the far right. All of those are endangered. There's one candidate in there. And these links are linked to every document that's public and finalized. So there might be recovery plans. There might be the rule for a proposed listing. There are all the publications that uh, relate to that species, whether they're the service or not, as long as they are open access. And I would highly recommend that anybody who does conservation work as relates to species, or if you're uh, a researcher in the biocontrol field, that you check this database out if you don't already. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Courtney, who will talk about our very specific role in consultation under the Endangered Species Act as it pertains biocontrol regulation. All right, thanks, Cindy. So after the TAG has completed their work, and if APHIS wants to pursue authorizing the release of a biocontrol agent, they'll start a conversation with us about Endangered Species Act compliance. So just to give some context on the larger process, the, the ESA provides uh, a means whereby the ecosystem on which endangered and threatened species depend may be conserved. And in order to accomplish that conservation, the ESA directs all federal agencies to work to conserve federally listed species and to use their authorities to further the purposes of the act. So the job of conserving species really belongs to all of us. Section seven of the ESA outlines the procedures for federal interagency cooperation to conserve federally listed species in designated critical habitat. And then Section 7A2 of the Act requires that federal agencies consult with us to ensure that their actions don't jeopardize the continued existence of listed species or destroy or adversely modify critical habitat. So after APHIS decides to pursue a Section 7 consultation with us on permitting the release of a biocontrol agent, they begin putting together their assessment. They'll define the action area and determine what listed species and critical habitats occur within that area. So the action area includes all areas that will be affected directly or indirectly by the action and not just the immediate area involved in the action. So not just where the agent is released, but wherever the agent can spread. So in the case of biocontrol agents, it's going to be the entire contiguous U.S. APHIS will then consider if the release of the agent will affect any listed species or critical habitats within the action area. And if the answer is no, they would make a no effect determination and consultation with us wouldn't be required. So this would be a highly unlikely scenario given how many listed species there are in the U.S. I'm just pointing it out to help explain how the overall process can generally play out. And then if the release of an agent could affect a listed species or critical habitat, APHIS makes a may affect determination. So under Section 7 of the ESA, federal agencies must consult with us when any action they carry out, fund, or authorize may affect a federally listed species or critical habitat. And then when a may affect determination is made, APHIS will consider if the action will result in adverse effects to a listed species or critical habitats. 
So if no adverse effects are anticipated, APHIS makes a not likely to adversely affect determination. They'll write up an analysis supporting their conclusions, and then they'll request our concurrence with their determination. So there can be a lot of back and forth at this stage with APHIS and earlier stages as well, but we'll ultimately respond with a concurrence saying, yes, we agree with your determination or a non-concurrence letter. There is also an option for APHIS to make a likely to adversely affect determination, which means there would be negative effects to one or more individuals of a species or critical habitat features. This would result in formal consultation with us and we would draft what's called a biological opinion to determine whether the action would jeopardize a species or cause an adverse modification to critical habitat. So I'm not going to talk about formal consultation today because when it comes to releasing biocontrol agents to control weeds, APHIS strives to keep the consultation informal. And this is really positive because this not only speeds up the consultation process, but it helps APHIS meet their responsibilities under the ESA because they are working to ensure that there aren't any adverse effects to listed species. So under informal consultation, effects are determined to be insignificant, discountable, and or completely beneficial. So insignificant effects are those that can't be meaningfully measured, detected, or evaluated, and it should never, they should never reach a level of take. So an example of this is the Everglades snail kite that occasionally nests in a weedy tree, Melaleuca. It's been targeted for biological control, and the biocontrol agent reduces seed production, but it doesn't kill the trees. So because the agent only slowly affects the trees over many years, and there's an abundance of available native vegetation for the bird to nest in, potential effects are insignificant. Discountable effects are negative effects that are extremely unlikely to occur. An example is a biocontrol agent that feeds on a listed plant, but the listed plant occurs in a significantly different habitat type than the target weed. So exposure to the agent is extremely unlikely. And then completely beneficial effects are contemporaneous positive effects without any adverse effects. So for the rest of my time, I'm going to talk a bit about what kinds of information we evaluate when considering potential effects to listed species or critical habitat. So first, we get a biological assessment from APHIS with their determination on effects. This assessment incorporates information from the, the researcher's petition, but it will also include other scientific literature, especially literature specific to threatened and endangered species. And then when we review the assessment, we'll also consider any additional literature. So a large part of what we evaluate is the host specificity test results on the target weed and non-target plants. And this information is key because it gives us insight into what the anticipated effects might be to listed species. So with host specificity testing, we'll consider the ovipositing behavior and larval development of the agent. We'll ask, can the agent reproduce and sustain populations on non-target plants? We'll also consider the foraging behavior of the agent. We'll ask, you know, what part of the plant does the agent affect? Are they mature leaves or developing leaves? We'll ask what kind of damage occurs to these plant parts. Maybe it's defoliation of the leaves or formation of galls. And then how much damage occurs and over what time period. We'll also consider what the dispersal mechanism is for the agent, so how it spreads and how quickly it will potentially spread to new areas. So if a weed is widely distributed across the U.S. and an agent to control that weed is only initially released in the West, how long will it take for the agent to get to the East Coast? Now, when consulting on the release of biocontrol agents, recall that the action area includes the entire contiguous U.S. because wherever the conditions would allow the agent to survive or thrive, we must assume that it might. So we'll also consider if the agent can reproduce or feed on or cause other damage to any listed plant species within the contiguous U.S., especially those species that are closely related to the target weed and are found in the same kind of habitat type. We'll also consider if the agent can feed on or cause other damage to non-target species that a listed species relies on. So the federally endangered Kino checker spot butterfly, for example, relies on this host plant Plantago, which is a common species. And in a hypothetical scenario, if, a non, if there were non-target impacts that included feeding on Plantago, we would consider impacts to the checker spot butterfly. 
So some of the questions we think about are, okay, so how common is plantago where the butterfly occurs? Even if, or maybe we'd ask, even if the biocontrol agent feeds on plantago in controlled settings, when the agent has choices in the field, how um, does it feed on it? And if so, how much feeding is expected to occur? We might also ask how likely would it be for the agent to even come in contact with plantago where the butterfly occurs? Another thing we'll ask is, does a listed species use or rely on the target weed for feeding, breeding, or sheltering? And if yes, if the target, um, is the target weed critical to one of those activities? Or will the target weed continue to provide the same functions for the species after the plant is affected by the agent? So for example, the Florida bonneted bat, it may roost in melaleuca tree cavities, and the biocontrol agent reduces seed production in these trees but it won't kill the trees. So Melaleuca will continue to provide roosting habitat for the bat species. And then in cases where a listed species uses or relies on a target weed, we'll also take into consideration what is expected to replace the weed if the agent is expected to be very effective. So we'll think about things like the landscape, the ecosystem or hydrology and how it might be affected. So we ran into this when a tamarisk leaf beetle was released and was very effective at targeting the tamarisk tree. The southwestern willow flycatcher is dependent on tamarisk in certain areas in the southwest for nesting and the agent impacted the bird species in unexpected ways. So now that I've gone through a few examples of what information we evaluate, I just want to point out again this ecosite. So when I receive a request for consultation on a biocontrol agent from APHIS, as I read through the assessment, I will go to species recovery plans in ECOS, which as Cindy mentioned, they can be accessed by anyone in the public. And I'll do this to read more about the species that APHIS made effect not likely to adversely affect determination on. And I might do keyword searches for the target weed to see if the recovery plan mentions it at all. And so we just wanted to point this site out because ECOS can be a very helpful website, no matter what field of invasive species work you are engaged in, whether it's biocontrol work or not, at some point in time, you might find that you have questions about a federally listed species. And this is a great place to find that kind of information. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Cindy and Courtney. That was a great presentation packed with a lot of information. So really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, we are going to now invite our final speaker for today, Bob Fannensteel, to come up and join us for the final presentation. And then we'll have some time for Q&A. So go ahead and put those questions in the Q&A box and we'll have some time at the end for that. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. So today I'm going to talk about the regulatory process for classical biological control agents of weeds and how we ensure safety through the regulatory process. First, I'd like to thank Charlene, Cindy, and Courtney for their presentations. They did a great job presenting some of the, their roles as researchers tag chairs, tag members, and the Fish and Wildlife Service through their consultation process that we uh, undergo with them. So that's great. I will be referring to all of those processes as I go through this talk and try to present really how, how all of this information flows through the regulatory process and where there are decision points that help us ensure safety. I am the biocontrol specialist with PPQ in the Pest Pathogen Biocontrol Permitting Unit, and I end up being their herd master of this crew in some ways, I guess. So part of this will be overview. Some of the things I'll touch on have already been touched on, but you know, I'm trying to frame everything, so bear with me. As Charlene mentioned, you know, at its most basic, biological control is the control of populations of one organism by another organism, whatever organ that is, whether it would be an herbivore, a pathogen, or, you know, a virus. So there are, there are many things that we could consider here. And in some cases, this can be immensely effective. In the bottom, there are pictures of water hyacinth, which is an invasive weed that's invasive around the world and the release of two weevils have resulted in immense benefits in many areas of the world in controlling this particular weed. So 
when it's effective, biocontrol is immensely effective and it keeps giving. You know, it's not something that has to be applied every year. Another thing we should note, or I should note, as we're going through this presentation, we are specifically addressing weeds. However, many of these processes I'm talking about also apply to biological control of plant pests, like insect, mites, slugs. And this can include parasitic wasps, predators, pathogens, entomophagous nematodes, and I end up coordinating all of this for weeds and biological control of insects. As Charlene mentioned, you know, in this case, we're specifically addressing classical biological control. And one of the aspects of that is, you know, originally was the, you know, researchers noticed that invasive species are usually less important as pests in their original range. You know, in part, that's generally, they have few natural enemies in the new range. They have escaped from control, as it were. And the basic tenet of classical biological control is to discover those natural enemies from the, you know, the pest's home range and introduce, introduce them to the invasive range to achieve control. Now, the, you know, as I mentioned, in part, this can have great benefits. You can target pests where few other options exist. It's very cost effective. And generally, there are very few non-target effects versus other control measures like the application of herbicides. However, there are risks. And if not carefully evaluated, an introduced organism can have very damaging non-target effects, both direct and indirect. These effects can cascade through multiple trophic levels. And in part, all of this regulatory oversight resulted from many misguided attempts in the early to mid-1900s. There were quite a few biological control agents or putative biological control agents that were released without evaluation and have caused and continue to cause uh, great environmental damage. So in part from a number of different acts of Congress, the USDA has jurisdiction to regulate the movement and introduction of biological control agents. So as part of that, permits are required from APHIS for any of the following movements. Any importation of a biological control is or organism into the US is requires a permit, an importation permit. Any movement of a biological control agent between states requires a permit. If you import biological control agents into quarantine. Every three years to continue to keep them in quarantine, you must obtain another permit. And then fourth and last, and what we're going to be talking about here is any proposal to release a novel biological control organism into the environment requires a permit. All of these permits get reviewed at the state level and each state may have their own permit requirements that are outside of USDA jurisdiction. And they, you know, an applicant will have to interact with each state in, the, in those capacities. So when we look at the process for introducing a novel biological control agent and this environmental compliance process, it really boils down to an evaluation of risk. But what risks are we really evaluating? And at, at its most basic as, aspect, it's, you know, that we might establish a new pest. We don't want a new pest. We have plenty of pests, you know. So we don't want to establish a new pest versus a beneficial organism. So that's our goal is to essentially develop criteria, evaluate these organisms to make sure that we don't introduce anything that might act as a pest. So what kinds of potential negative impacts, what risks are we concerned with? Obviously, from Cindy and Courtney's talks, we are concerned with the potential effect of a novel organism on threatened and endangered species or their habitats. We are concerned about the effects of non-target plants that should read biological control, my apologies, on uh, value to humans. So we don't want to introduce a biological control agent that will affect crops or ornamentals that are of value to us. We don't want to accidentally impact plants of cultural importance. 
to tribes or the general public. We also want to make sure that we don't accidentally cause other off-target effects. We don't want to introduce, you know, something that might become a nuisance pest. This has happened with biological control agents that attack insects, where they become pests of homeowners. We don't want to introduce something that might accidentally have negative effects on pollinators, native or, or honeybees. So these are all things that we evaluate before making the decision to introduce a new biological control agent. One thing we also realize is that you know, if we introduce a biological control agent, it does not recognize political borders. So there is an, a group in North America, the North American Plant Protection Organization, or NAPO, that is involved with the evaluation of biological control agents when they are proposed for release. In part, for North America, the NAPO Biocontrol Expert Group has developed regional standards for phytosanitary measures that address the minimum information we need for the petition of the first time release of a non-indigenous weed biological control agent that is available online as RSPM7. Once we get past the development of a petition, however, each country as a sovereign nation still has its own country specific regulatory structures. In Canada, petition goes to a review committee, a recommendation is made to their regulatory body, Canadian Food, I think I'm getting that wrong, the CFIA, and they make a decision. In Mexico, they have similar guidelines. It goes to a government agency. However, in the USA, by law, this is a longer multi-step process and we are particularly risk averse. So moving on to RSPM7, essentially developing a petition for the release of a novel biological control agent, this has been harmonized among countries for the basic information necessary. There must be a proposed action, including a statement of need. Obviously, if you want to bring in a biological control agent, but what you believe is a weed doesn't really rise to the standard of needing control, that would be an issue. We must have detailed information on the target weed and its taxonomy. This helps to develop the host plant uh, lists and helps us to evaluate risks to non-target species. We need very specific information about the biological control agent. This also informs our ability to evaluate risk. There's host specificity testing. There's an evaluation of environmental and economic impacts of the proposed release. There are necessary components of post-release monitoring and pre-release compliance to make sure that all of these steps are being taken care of appropriately. Now in this petition, the most important sections are the host specificity testing, and evaluation of environmental and economic impacts of the proposed release. Both of those sections very heavily go on to inform the regulatory process. So USDA and, and looking at our jurisdiction over this, essentially this whole environmental com compliance process is rooting in the writing of the APHIS permit. In the case of a petition for the release of a novel agent into the environment, permitting release of that agent is the federal action that triggers the compliance with two acts of Congress, the Endangered Species Act, as Cindy and Courtney covered, and the National Environmental Policy Act. And we'll go on to cover all of these in a little more detail. So prior to the introduction of an organism into the environment of the United States or its territories, environmental risk analyses are required before APHIS can issue permits. And, you know, by law, environmental compliance procedures must be followed. Release of a novel organism without this is illegal and subject to fines and imprisonment and death. I'm, I'm joking, my apologies. But these procedures are guided by the requirements of the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. Trying to 
fit all of this together into a flow chart so we can understand how all of this information informs the process. We have three major areas or uh, review processes within the overall process. First, as Charlene went into and Cindy as well, we have the APHIS Technical Advisory Group review. This is a technical review. It you know, contains 13 agencies with different mandates in the U.S. There's a great deal of attention paid to host specificity testing, an ecological review of non-target risks, as well as, you know, NAPO country considerations. If, you know, something that we would want to release here in the U.S. might negatively, negatively affect a plant or crop of concern in Canada, that's a very big issue, and we want to make sure that we address that. Now, after that tag review, there ends up being a tag recommendation and an APHIS decision whether to move forward. And we'll go into that in a little more detail in a moment. If we decide to move forward from the tag recommendation, then we would enter into the Section 7 Endangered Species Act consultation as described by Cindy and Courtney. This would require the development of a biological assessment as was already presented and an evaluation of effect on threatened and endangered species and critical habitats. Moving from there, we would hope to get a letter of concurrence for the release of the novel organism from the Fish and Wildlife Service. That would allow us to move on to the NEPA review of an environmental assessment by tribes and the public. This requires the development of an environmental assessment and essentially looks at effects of the proposed release on the human condition. So how, are, how would this release potentially impact plants of value or habitats of value, species of value to our culture? And then should we make it through this entire process and everything looks great, it looks like we've addressed all the risks, then we would hope to come to an APHIS environmental finding of a FONSI, which is a finding of no significant impact, and then we can move forward. So going down through these sections individually, as Charlene kind of went over, there is a petition review by the technical advisory group. APHIS actually receives that petition. We forward it to the TAG for review. All of the reviews would go to Charlene as the TAG committee chair. She would then consolidate all of those reviews and make a recommendation to APHIS. That recommendation would come to me where I would evaluate it, focusing on aspects relative to the environmental compliance process, at which point we would move to a decision. Now, the TAG can make a number of determinations. One of those determinations is that they don't have enough information. They have concerns that need to be addressed before they can recommend either to release or not to release. They may send, they may make a request of the petitioner to address certain issues. APHIS can also make this request. So, it behooves the petitioner to work with APHIS, Fish and Wildlife, and the TAG in advance to make sure they can address any potential issues before submitting the petition. If we look at this process by itself without a request for additional information, it might take six to nine months. Once a request for additional information goes through, then that timeline can be drastically changed. If it's a matter of clarification, it may just be a matter of months. If it's a request for additional research, then it might take years. And this is a very important consideration because all of this research is expensive and takes a considerable amount of time. If, however, there isn't a need for additional information, then the TAG may recommend that may make a recommendation for release. At that point, that would come to uh, me with APHIS and in coordination with other APHIS employees, we would make a decision to move forward or not. The TAG is strictly a advisory group. In most cases, if the TAG recommends not to release, 
APHIS does not move forward with an agent. However, there are some cases where the TAG has made a rec recommendation for release and APHIS has deemed it to be too uh, risky and decided not to move forward with addition, without additional information demonstrating a lack of risk. But presuming we can move forward at this point, we would then proceed to the Endangered Species Act informal consultation. So when we look at the Section 7 Endangered Species Act consultation, APHIS program and policy development, their environmental risk analysis services, or ERAS, would prepare a biological assessment using information from the petition and would initiate this process. Courtney covered that very well, so I won't go into it in too much detail, but essentially we are seeking a letter of concurrence that the release of the biocontrol agent will not adversely affect any threatened or endangered species or designated habitat. As Courtney mentioned, the biological assessment and the evaluation does not restrict release or movement of the biological control agent within the continental US. As they mentioned, that certainly does now include Alaska. However, like the TAG review, this informal consultation with fish and wildlife can be iterative. So if the biological assessment and the information therein does not address all of the concerns of risk by the Fish and Wildlife Service or APHIS, additional information may be requested. Similar to the situation with the TAG, what might be a, in this case, six months to a year process could become much longer. If it's just clarification, maybe months. If additional research is involved, then this process could take um, years before a decision is actually made. Now, if everything looks great, there's no perceived risk to threatened and endangered species or habitats, then Fish and Wildlife would draft a letter of concurrence with the proposal to release the biological control agent. APHIS would then move that forward and to our next part of the process. The next part of the process specifically would address our requirements under the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. And this specifically has two components, a tribal consultation and a availability of the environmental assessment for public comment. Again, as I mentioned before, ERAS would prepare the draft environmental assessment and a regulatory work plan. Permitting would prepare a series of informational documents and in co collaboration with field operations and the state plant health directors would make that available for tribal consultation generally for uh, a period of 30 to 45 days. And I'm getting ahead of myself. So here we can see the flow chart covering the draft environmental assessment being prepared on the left and then moving through the process. The first part of that process is the tribal consultation, which is usually 30 days. All tribes within the region where the target weed occurs may comment. If we believe the biological control agent has potential to expand its range beyond that of the target weed, we would make that environmental assessment to all tribes in the potentially affected area. Once that tribal consultation is complete, PPQ would approve and prepare additional documents and submit to our regulatory analysis and development group for further processing and approvals so that it can be published in the Federal Register. This would make the environmental assessment available to the general public, typically for a 30-day public comment period. However, for uh, highly controversial target weeds, this can be extended. Looking at the whole process for NEPA, we can see what I just presented across the top. That might take a year and a half on the outside. And then if everything goes through that process, we would then move to the finalization stages before approving release. So when we publish the environmental assessment for public comment, all of those go into a repository associated with the Federal Register. All of the public comments are reviewed and answered as needed by environmental risk assessment in consultation with 
permitting and potentially the petitioner if additional information is needed. All comments that demonstrate a concern for the action must be responded to. There's no way around this. We must respond to all comments of concern. APHIS at this point would review and consider all of these comments, potentially gaining additional input from fish and wildlife, tribes, and the public if necessary to arrive at an environmental finding. This environmental finding would lead to a FONSI, which is a finding of no significant impact. We would present that to PPQ's plant health protection officials and essentially move that up the chain for approval. If uh, all of the information that we've received from the petitioner, Fish and Wildlife Service, the public supports release of the agent, we would then get that finding of no significant impact signed. PPQ would then finalize the environmental assessment and incorporate all those responses to the public comment. Upon this finding, PPQ can complete the permitting process that would allow the biocontrol agent to be released from containment facilities or to be further imported from outside of the country for release. And the final environmental assessment that incorporated all of the responses to the comments as well as the FONSI would be published in the Federal Register for Perpetuity. Once that permit has been issued allowing removal of the biocontrol agent from containment, we may then have additional permits that are required to move it from the state that it's being worked on and initially released in to other states that contain the target weed and you know, would desire to release that biological control agent. And that's my 20 minutes of rambling for today. So thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone for attending. And I believe we have at least some time for questions. Hi, okay, thank you so much, Bob. That was great, I love your flow chart. Thank you for doing that. My brain works in flow charts, so I absolutely really appreciated that. <laughs> That was fantastic. Uh, we do have some questions for the group. So if Courtney and Cindy and Charlene want to pop on camera, we've been answering some questions in the chat and in writing in the Q&A box. So go ahead and make sure you take a look at that answered tab as well. All righty. So I think we've answered everything in the chat already. So I'm just going to kind of go down this list in the Q&A. Okay. And anybody can answer. What if the impact of an invasive species on endangered species is much, much greater than the potential impact of a biological control? So th this analysis and the environmental compliance process is really all about risk. It does not directly involve a benefit cost analysis. And in this play, in this consideration, we would be looking at the cost, you know, to the current cost of an invasive species to, to uh, threaten an endangered species or habitats. However, I don't believe that is specifically prohibited by law. And that would be something that would take potentially, and Cindy can chime in here in a moment, at the very least some level of formal consultation where fish and wildlife might need to make a determination whether potential risks of a biological control agent might not outweigh the observed impact of an invasive species. Cindy? You know, I don't have much to add to that. So Bob, Bob, Bob is right. So it is our job, and Courtney should weigh in as well, as this is how she makes her living. But we will weigh, that was a difficult question, by the way. So we have to weigh what are the impacts to the species. And put the, you know, it's like Bob said, you have to put that, that other part aside as we weigh what the impact, as we examine what the impacts are to the listed species. And uh, I think Bob mentioned formal consultation, and you might actually get there in a situation like that. Courtney, do you want to add anything? So there, so APHIS isn't prohibited from doing a formal consultation at all. They can do that. They haven't been 
doing that. They strive to have informal consultations, but APHIS needs to make sure that their actions can't, don't jeopardize the continued, exist, the continued existence of threatened or endangered species. That's the key. There, there can be some take of a species, but, they, but federal agencies are just required not to jeopardize the continued existence. Sure, and, and this would certainly be the difficult search circumstance where the invasive weed is jeopardizing and a threatened and endangered species. So, you know, it would be complicated. Now, I will say that if we are looking at potential impacts on plants of economic or cultural importance, so we're not talking about the consultation with fish and wildlife, but some other kind of potential impact, we have not done that cost benefit analysis, but it is an option. So it would be an option where, excuse me, APHIS could move forward with an economic impact analysis and potentially incorporate that in our decision making. That also has not been done, but is actually under consideration in certain circumstances. Okay, thank you. Starting off with a tough one. I'm not sure if this next one is a question or more of just a, a statement, but there's an action alert in the Q&A regarding the status of pathogen quarantine facilities to assist biocontrol research for fig buttercup. And I just wanted to see if anybody had any comment or information on that before we move on. Sure. So I am not aware of anyone working on fig buttercup. That's not to say that there are not people addressing it. I have not uh, received any permanent applications for importation of any pathogens or agents for fig buttercup. And I would have to go look at the species name, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, that's a new one on my radar. Right now, there is one facility that has some dedication to looking at pathogens for as biocontrol agents of weeds. That's at Fort Detrick in Frederick, Maryland. I saw that William Bruckhart, I had commented on that. There is an individual there, Matthew Tankos, who is working on pathogens of a common crupina in the Western US. That's not to say that other researchers who desired to work on a pathogen of a biological control agent, I mean, pathogen as a biological control agent, could not import a pathogen in pathogen into their quarantine facility for work. That all they would need to do is if they applied for a permit, APHIS regulates containment facilities. So they would work with our containment sci scientists to make sure that the facility could handle the pathogen. There's nothing specifically restricting a containment facility from not working on plant pathogens per se. Thank you for that. Okay. One more question here. <clears throat> Are the effects of invasive control on non-target species given equal scrutiny, whether the control agent is biological or chemical? So I think we're talking about pesticide permitting here. If, is it more difficult to predict the non-target effects from biological control agents than chemical control agents? Arlene, shall I take this one as well? <laughs> she smiled. So that's a yes. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so once a chemical control has been approved by the EPA, it would have restrictions on how it is used. Generally, there are, actually, I guess this would get to fish and wildlife. Obviously, there would be no approval for use of an herbicide in a critical habitat or, you know, directly adjacent to a threatened or endangered plant. However, if, you know, many private landowners apply pesticides and herbicides relatively indiscriminately. So there are, can be significant non-target effects on plants, animals, you know. So, so in that sense, there is less control. I believe our process looks much more heavily at threatened and endangered species up front. However, once a biological control agent is released, we can't take it back. If it establishes and then there are subsequent impacts, you know, we might be able to work to remediate that. However, we cannot take that organism back. That is, I would say, the primary reason that we are so rigorous with this entire process is to make it exceedingly risk averse to avoid 
the many circumstances that happened in the past where biological control uh, agents were released without appropriate scrutiny, and then they caused significant non-target effects, whether it be on threatened and endangered species or other plants and habitats of value. I would also add that in the Endangered Species Act arena, when it comes to registration of pesticides, that very few nationwide pesticide consultations have been brought to completion between the United States, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service on listed species. The list is probably less than a handful on those pesticides which have gone through the consultation process. Not thinking about federally listed species, it's also true that every 15 years, US EPA reviews the registration of active ingredients. And sometimes active ingredients are taken off the market or there are further restrictions placed on the use. And a lot of times, not always, but sometimes that is due to newly understood and newly documented non-target effects. So short answer is yes, I think it's very difficult with chemicals to understand all of the non-target effects. Sometimes it takes a while to know what those are for better or worse. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, one more and then we're gonna call it, uh, call it done. Has the biocontrol of multiflora Rose, native rose rosette disease been being kept out of transfer to Eurasia? Sorry, I stumbled uh, on that. <laughs> no problem. So actually this relates a little bit to Charlene's discussion of the Nagoya protocol and access sharing to biological control agents. So USDA APHIS regulates importation. We do not regulate export. There are many countries that do regulate export, but essentially any of these agents can be shared around the world without any U.S. jurisdiction. Now that would be very different for a threatened or endangered species. Moving or removing would be different, but these biological control agents or pathogens can be moved. Now I do, in certain circumstances, provide letters that actually say we have no jurisdiction to researchers who want to move biocontrol agents. But my understanding, you know, we always kind of are myopic in that we feel like, oh, all of these invasive species are coming from the world and, you know, becoming established in the U.S. You know, how dare the world give us all their invasive species? Well, the world is full of invasive species that have come from the U.S. as well. Common ragweed is a wonderful example of that. Huge problem in Europe. But they've imported a beetle from the U.S. that is actually amazingly effective in part of Europe at controlling common ragweed. And they've demonstrated immense reductions in pollen production and discomfort from the populace. So... I know, a long rambling answer because that's what I do, but no, we are not impeding that at all. Thank you. I could listen to the rambling all day. It's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> it's not rambling. It's a lot of knowledge and experience. It is so valuable. So thank you so very much for being here. Want to listen to it. All righty. Well, with that, I want to share just a few final thoughts. Wherever you are at in the world today, please just stand up and give our amazing panelists a round of applause for me. Thank you all so very much for being here. I have a better understanding of how this all works start to finish, so I'm sure everybody else does as well. So again, thank you all so very much for being here. Just want to share, and we will have this recording posted to our public YouTube channel just as quick as we can process it, and we'll fix the volume on that first presentation so that you can hear all of the great stuff that was that was in there if your volume wasn't good on your end. Quickly, before we, before we just call it a day here, just want to remind you all on NISA.org, we have our new event map up. So uh, you can see virtual events, you can see events going on live, in person, in your community, hopefully. If you know of an event, please put it up there the whole month of May, we're celebrating NISA, and we'd love to promote you and the events that you're doing out there. We have webinars the rest of the week. 
Our resource toolkit is up there. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us. And if you have any questions or if you're interested in helping to plan NISA for next year and you're a NASMA member, go ahead and drop me an email. We'd love to have you join our legislative committee and get more involved. So we have two more webinars left this week. Tomorrow, sponsored by the Aquatic Plant Management Society is our plant management priorities. So aquatic weeds tomorrow. And then Friday, we'll get into a lot of terrestrial weed discussion, looking at a comparative analysis of state noxious weed lists, and we will get a great overview of the Western Weed Action Plan. So I hope that you will join us 1 p.m. Central the next two days as well. So with that, again, thanks to our panelists. Thank you to the Biological Control Committee in NASMA for putting this together. They're also putting together our December webinar and working on some new online learning. So I'm just really appreciative of everybody on the Biological Control Committee for NASMA. It's an amazing group of people. So just thank you to all of you. And yeah, with that, have a great rest of your day and we hope we see you soon. Bye everyone.